Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the NAPSIC virtual training on May 26th. This is a technical skills for building U.S. National Grid-enabled decision support tools. Today, we're going to be focused on technical skills and abilities of, of using desktop and web GIS to both build USND products and then both give you some tips and tricks of uh, how you configure those things appropriately and some gotchas you might want to look out for as you move forward. My name is Ryan Lankloss. I'm a senior program manager with the NAPSIC Foundation. And with me today, I've got a great set of speakers. We've got Peter Hanna, who's a firefighter paramedic with Baltimore City Fire Department, and Stephen Polikoff, who's retired captain with Fire Department of New York City, who will be handling both the demonstrations and tips around desktop and web environment. So I'm glad they're able to join us today. A little bit about NAPSIG for those of you who may not know who we are. So the National Alliance for Public Safety GS Foundation, or NAPSIG Foundation, is a 501c3, we're a nonprofit organization that was established in 2005 with a vision to provide you the resources to support uh, your operators. So if you're a GIS person supporting the operators in your organization, and also to equip those operators with the knowledge and kind of skills that they need to apply geospatial technology and data to, to do your mission. We're 7,000 members. That's a lot of you that are on the phone with us today and attending this virtual training are members of NAPSIG. If you're not a member, we'd love to have you. Just go to our website and you can sign up with your email to, to get notification of both virtual trainings and other outreach activities that we do as part of the NAPSIC Foundation. And the key to those 7,000 members is just like we're talking. So it's GIS and operations staff. We're there to kind of blend the two together and to train both sides equally on how to speak GIS and technology to support the missions that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So today, what are we here for? This purpose and is really, again, technically oriented. So this is to build your skills as a GIS specialist and a, uh, an operator in your organization to both build the USNG-enabled support tools. Uh, and how do you start to put those into to practice in the mission that you do every day? We're going to look at creating USNG paper maps and ArcGIS for desktop, following some standard guidelines that we have in practice from FGDC and others. We're going to look at how you add U.S. national grips and the U.S. National Grid into your web maps in ArcGIS Online. And then more importantly, for the administrators out there that manage ArcGIS Online environments, how do you actually add USNG locators to your organization and enable that so that the search functions work uh, and your applications work as well in support of USNG? We'll actually leave you today with a number of resources, so you'll have ability to download this presentation and the slide deck that we'll do today, but we'll also give you a link out to a number of other resources and virtual trainings that are not so technically focused, but a little bit more on the implementation side of U.S. National Grid, um, as well as places to get started with templates for ArcMap and others that allow you to, to download and kind of kick off the things that we'll talk about today. So our agenda is pretty straightforward. We're going to start with desktop product, where the majority of you probably work day in and day out uh, as a GIS specialist in your organization. We're going to take some time to look at U.S. National Grid maps, and Steve's going to start us on that point. Then we'll transition to the web environment. We'll, we'll start off at the basics by building a web map, adding U.S. national grid lines to that. Pete's going to walk us through some gotchas, things to look out for, which is a little bit different environment uh, in online. It is desktop and the way that U.S. national grid is exposed and used within the web map environment. And then I'll pick up the web map that Pete's done. We'll take a look at then transitioning that into a web app builder. We'll talk more about that as we get there, how to configure the web app builder environment to both expose U.S. National Grid and allow you to search against that. And then finally, as we discussed, come back to making sure that all the back-end things are aligned in ArcGIS Online for your administrator to add U.S. National Grid and close out with additional resources and any questions you may have. So for those of you that are attending today, if you have questions, um, all of you have been muted today. Uh, that's to make sure that we can hear the presenters well. If you do have questions, just use your chat function. You'll find that in the WebEx window. Just go ahead and type your questions in there. Submit those to the team here, and we'll take a look at those at the end of the presentation to make sure we touch on any of the important questions. If there's a chance we can't answer your question today or we don't get to it, that's okay. We'll be sure to catalog those things, and we'll reach out to you directly after today's virtual training to make sure you've got the answer you need or any additional support that may help you along the way. So with that, we're going to start right into it. I'm going to turn over to, to Steve Polikoff, who's going to get us into the desktop environment. So, Steve, let me stop sharing. I'll promote you up, and the desktop is yours to begin with. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Okay, so today I'm going to be uh, presenting using uh, the U.S. National Grid 
in uh, ArcGIS Desktop. Uh, there are certain elements to creating a, a U.S. National Grid map that have to be adhered to to make sure you use the right projection, and so a user can then use this map uh, as a navigational tool and mark out their coordinates. Uh, the most important thing when creating your National Grid map is making sure your projection is, is correct. Your, the U.S. National Grid projection is based on, on UTM, and then what the National Grid does is it takes each national, I'm sorry, UTM zone and breaks it down uh, further into smaller, smaller chunks of areas throughout the country. Uh, this map that you're viewing on my screen right now is for the Washington, D.C. area, which is in a UTM zone of 18 north. So it's very important that our projection is set to the to the proper zone within the UTM. Once you have your, your proper zone correct, the, the first thing that you'll notice as I zoom in on this PDF map is your lines will all be um, straight up and down and horizontally left to right. Uh, if these squares are not in a, an exact square or seem distorted, which you'll see actually when you cross over various uh, UTM zones, you'll, you'll see that, which will be presented in a little bit by Pete Hanna. Um, on your desktop version, if it's not square, then you're definitely in the wrong projection. So that, this is vital that you double check this, make sure you're in the right zone uh, for the area that you're working in. Then the, the next most important thing for, again, for marking out your coordinates and, and using the ability to navigate on, an, on a, the national grid map is your reference scales. Your reference scales are vital because when you use a Romer scale, there's only certain scales that can be used to match up with your Romer scale. You have, I'm sorry, the image is a little bit blurry, But your scales here on your Roma scale are 1 to 2,400, 1 to 24,000, and everything is in meters. Uh, you also have a 1 to 6,000. You have a 1 to 50,000. And up top here, you have the 1 to 25,000 and 1 to 2,500. So when creating a USNG map, you can't just use any scale to zoom into an area that you want. Uh, you'll notice. Uh, actually, right now, my scale here in my uh, desktop version is actually off. It's, it's right now showing at 11,287. So you have to make sure that that scale is set to 6,000 uh, to get the proper measuring device on your Romer scale. The next most important thing on a USNG map are your elements here at the bottom of bottom page of your map. Typically, uh, on a USNG map, uh, most of the elements are listed on the bottom. It doesn't mean that the elements can't be listed on the top, but the so-called uh, de facto standard that's utilized is typically on the bottom of the map. Each one of these elements are very important. Uh, the, the first thing that you'll notice as I zoom in here is this U.S. National Grid uh, zone designation. This is going to tell your map user uh, what designation they're in. And now, in this case, it's 18S. Uh, so as I mentioned in the uh, UTM projection, uh, we're in the 18 North uh, area of the country. And in the, eight, in the zone 18, it breaks it down, and in this case, it's letter S. So that's going to tell the user what grid zone designation they're in throughout the country. Then the next most important thing is the 100,000 meter square ID, uh, which in this case is, is UJ. So as you give your coordinates, the, the first part of your coordinates will be 18SUJ. 
again, that tells you what part of the country that you're in. Now, typically when you're giving coordinates, especially in a very tight area, in this case of Washington, D.C., we know that if there was an incident, we're always dealing in the 18SUJ. So when giving a coordinate of, let's say, 18SUJ 227, we don't have to constantly tell our, our search and rescue teams or our incident management teams or any teams operating in this area. We do not have to constantly say 18SUJ 2207. We could just use the coordinates 2207, and the user should know that they are uh, operating within 18SUJ, and then just use the numbers to navigate throughout the map. So this, this piece of your map is vital to a U.S. national grid map. Now, typically, when you're using RTIS desktop, um, you need a special extension to be able to insert a lot of these elements onto your map, particularly the U.S. National Grid uh, designation zone and the magnetic north. Unfortunately, it's, a, it's an extension within ArcMap. It doesn't come prepackaged. So you are not going to be able to instantly insert this. The extension called production mapping is uh, quite expensive. And on a typical case, um, most agencies would not have this extension. So you're going to have to work with somebody else, uh, whether it be on site that potentially has uh, this tool, uh, or you're going to have to reach out to somebody, and it's, it's a Good thing to know up front to have some context that have uh, the production mapping extension. Uh, if not, there are you know ways where you could manually create this in a, in a paint program. Or like I said, if if you know somebody with the extension, they can actually take a screenshot of it, which is what I did here, and then you can email this PNG file or JPEG file, however it's delivered, and then just uh, take this and copy and paste it into your data frame as an image rather than um, a live uh, grid zone designation box. The next most important element is the uh, magnetic north and the true north arrow. Uh, again, this is a part of the production mapping uh, extension. So if you have it, it will you'll be able to insert it, and this will actually rotate. Um, with your map. So if you're not showing true north on your map uh, and you have it, uh, your map rotated, which is not really a good idea for a, a USNG map, but this is a live uh, magnetic north arrow. So this will rotate with your map. And we're going to discuss uh, the difference uh, momentarily about magnetic north and, and true north and why that element is important. The next piece of the essential material that is needed is your scale reference. So again, it, this you know instantly tells the user that it's one to six thousand. So again, when they're using their Roma scale, they they know uh, which scale tool to use on the Roma scale. And then I typically uh, like to put in the text of you know one inch to uh, feet or miles. And also, it's important to have the print size of the map, because uh, especially if you're going to PDF this map and, and email it out, you don't want users to print this map at the wrong scale. So when they print the map, it actually has to say fit the page, so all your sizing of scales and, and scale bars and everything else are a match. Uh, if you use any other sort of print functionality that's going to try to squeeze it onto a smaller page or, or enlarge it to an, uh, an 11 by 17 page, all your scales are going to be off and, and your Roma scales are going to be unusable. So it's very important to show what print size that you want on your map. And then the next uh, important thing is your scale bar, uh, which should be on any uh, typical map, but it's vital on uh, a USNG map. And typically what we do on a USNG map, because the 
UTM projection is in meters, we insert two scale bars, uh, one in meters and, again, one in miles, or you can do it in feet, and use the U.S. Uh, conversions. Uh, that's just handy for the user, but the meter scale bar has to be included. That Again, that is vital to USNG met. And then you can also put in other information uh, about your projection, and I just happen to put in a link here for uh, the Federal Geographic Data Committee uh, and their site for the USNG, if anybody wants to look up uh, additional material. And typically, uh, the agency logo will go on the map, and always, again, this is an, uh, an important uh, habit to get into just for a USNG map, but you should always have the date that the map was created on, typically on any map. Just backing up real quickly, uh, going back to the magnetic north and true north, um, why is this important? Well, this is important. We should always have a, a north arrow, uh, again, a, an important element on any map, but it's vital on a USNG map because of that magnetic north. Um, again, a USNG map should always be true north, uh, just for the fact, again, if you want to uh, navigate utilizing the map or marking out coordinates, uh, that are given to you from a team or vice versa if you're sending a team out to a specific coordinate. Uh, this should always be true north. And again, your squares should always be square and there shouldn't be any distortions in them. The important part of the magnetic north is for uh, the end user uh, using the paper map and using a compass to try to navigate to that location. Now that's where your magnetic north and utilizing the compass is going to be quite important. The next important thing that I wanted to discuss uh, with ArcMap, and, and this has been an ongoing uh, conversation uh, for quite some time now with ESRI, but you'll notice um, the way I have my map labeled here, um, I have each 100 meter uh, cell uh, labeled. In this case, it's 078, 079, then we have the main uh, line of zero 08, and then, you know, keep going down, the next 100 meter is uh, zero 081 and zero 082 and zero 083, and, and continuing until we get to uh, the 100 meter line that's uh, zero 09. The reason why I point this out this morning is the fact that these labels here of, of the main 100 meter grid, or actually this is the 1,000 meter grid that's being labeled, will be done so automatically in ArcMap. So the 08 and the 09 on top, and the 22 here on the bottom, and to the right is 23. But it's this 100-meter grid uh, line that is not automatically labeled in uh, ArcMap. So this has to be done manually. And to perform this function, you'll see right off the bat, on my empty data frame here as I'm creating a USNG map is again, this thousand meter grid will automatically be labeled. And we can insert this by adding into our data frame, uh, I'm sorry, our data frame properties, we can add a grid. And typically what I'll do is I'll add a new grid and run through this wizard And at the end, when I, after I run through this, this wizard, I could then take this and go into my properties – I'm sorry, it's uh, the style button, not the properties – and if you s scroll down, you'll see down here the U.S. National Grid. Um, so when I add this element to my map, Again, I will automatically get the labels for the 1,000-meter grid. As I mentioned, it's the 100-meter grid that is the problem. And unfortunately, this is going to be a manual process, and it's a little painstaking. Uh, not that it's very hard to do, but as I mentioned, this is all going to have to be added in manually. 
And what I'd like to do to keep this uh, looking professional is I do a lot of copy and pasting. So what I do is I, I will add in my, my first number of 08. This should, should actually um, should actually be 07 because it's below. And here in my properties of that label, I can you know, change the symbol. I could change the font sizes. I could change the color if I wanted to. All the typical properties that you can change in a, uh, in a label. Uh, now, once I have it set, I hit OK. And I just hit uh, Control C and Control V uh, to copy it. And you want to do this 10 times to get down to the, to the next 1,000 meter, uh, thousand meter grid line. Uh, in this case, I, in my Washington, D.C. map here, my map ends uh, 200 meter grid cells below the 1,000 meter grid. But you'll see here, I want to go up to 089 until I get to 09 on the next 1,000 meter grid. So again, going down to the bottom of the map, I only need to label 200, um, I'm sorry, that's right, 200 meter grids. So I just need two zero sevens. Then what I could do here is I would spread them out and line them up with the proper lines. You wanna leave enough space for the, the smaller number. And then I'll highlight the two of these. You'll see the, a very soft dotted blue line showing that they are highlighted. Now I can right click on it, I can align, and I can align left. Then what I could do is I could add in another label, um, or I could even take this. I'm sorry, let me do that again. I could take this, I could copy and paste it again. And now I could change this to zero one. And I want to make this a little bit smaller than my 07. So I'll bump this down to a 6. And I'm going to take that and, I, I'm sorry, it shouldn't actually be 0, 1. It should just be 1. So I'll take out that 0. And now I have it here. And, I, and I, because it's an independent label, I could then you know, move this around. And you want to line this up to the type, top right corner of your 100 meter number. Then once I take this, I'm going to copy and paste it again, move it down to the next number. I'm going to change this element to its, uh, I'm sorry, this label to a two. I'm going to highlight these two, the uh, the number one and the number two. And I'm going to align these. I'm going to align them to the left. And now once this is completed, uh, and I have all this set as I do here, um, now I can highlight all four of these. And again, control C and control V to paste it. And now I can drag these to the other side of my map. And once I have those dragged, now I have the, the same corresponding numbers on both sides. And you can, you know, line them up correctly. Uh, you could use the align tool uh, if you wanted to, you know, highlight the number seven here and the number seven here. And again, I could use my align functionality to align the top. So as I said, it's, it's a little bit of a painstaking process, but once you have it down, uh, you can actually save these, and now I can actually take these, and I can copy them again, and I can take these and move them up to the number eight position. And once I have that done, I, I add the, in this case, the zero eight, uh, 1 through 089 to get it from 
each 100-meter grid properly labeled. And again, once you have all 10 of these done, it's the same thing. You copy and paste and bring them over to the right side. And then you have to do the same thing on the bottom side. But again, once these are set uh, and you want to create a new map at that point, um, moving over to, say, the next 1,000-meter grid, you could use your original labels and copy and paste them and just uh, alter the 100-meter uh, cell numbers uh, to the next ones up and copy and paste them all over again. So again, it's a little bit of a painstaking process, but once you have the, the first map down, it's not too bad. Uh, as I mentioned a few, few moments ago, there has been uh, several discussions uh, for quite some time now about actually having this built-in functionality within ArcMap, uh, the way it automatically labels the 1,000-meter grid, but to automatically label the 100-meter grid. The last uh, item I just would really like to point out uh, when you're creating this national grid map is it's always a, a wise idea also to add the um, a grid of your latitude longitude. And you would do it the same way where you would add a new grid, you would run through this wizard, and once you have that, you'll see that I have it set to latitude longitude, which you can change here in, in the style. Why is this important uh, on a U.S. national grid? Um, it's quite important because there will be times when maybe you get a latitude longitude uh, coordinate. So you want to make sure that is labeled on your map. And also when search and rescue teams, uh, typically during a wilderness search and rescues, and they uh, dealing with um, teams up in the air, particularly helicopters, Helicopters can't use uh, the U.S. national grid because they have no reference system. Uh, there has been some documentation that um, a search craft such as a helicopter should utilize a GPS and have that GPS set uh, with U.S. national grid. So when they report their coordinates down to the ground, uh, they'll be reporting a U.S. national grid coordinate rather than a latitude longitude. Several wilderness search and rescue people that I've spoke to about this have typically told me that aerial search crews don't do that. Um, I don't know the solution to that. I don't know in the future if that will get better. Uh, it should, but typically right now it, that's the way it works. So again, it's a, a good idea to have a separate grid uh, with your latitude longitude. And always be careful if uh, a crew whether it be air or ground, reports a uh, latitude, longitude coordinate to you and you're trying to get that onto your map, you always want to make sure that it's in the, uh, you understand the coordinate that it's in either decimal degrees or decimal degrees, I, I'm sorry, uh, degrees, minutes, seconds, and so on, um, because you don't want to be messing up your latitude, longitude coordinates. and. Uh, marking your coordinates to a different location than they actually should be. Uh, so those are the main things of, uh, that I wanted to present today, utilizing, uh, I'm sorry, for creating uh, and somewhat utilizing the U.S. National Grid. And you, you can always find additional information on the uh, USNG uh, Center uh, and also through the FGDC website. And as uh, Ryan mentioned, those links and uh, additional information will be provided uh, with the recording uh, of this webinar. So I'm going to pass it back over to Ryan. Great. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate that. So good presentation. Right? A couple of takeaways that I got, there are a lot of elements to keep in mind, right? especially in the paper map world. So remember the responders are going to be using those maps. So data frame and setting the correct projection is key for that. The zoom scale is extremely important so that their roamer scales are able to be used on the top of that map. And then all those surrounding elements that Steve described, I mean, there are a ton of those features uh, down there in the bottom of the map that, you know, while production mapping allows us to be able to, to implement pretty rapidly, not all of us have access to, right? So a lot of that's going to be manual in terms of the user interface, the editing. So the more you can templatize that, right, set up word templates for some of those features like the magnetic north and make those text editable things that you can manually go in and change are really key. So you may be thinking, how do I actually do that? Uh, so there are 
templates available at the end of the, the webinar today. We'll actually pass you a link to that. And included in that, there's a map package template for U.S. National Grid that has a surround just like Steve showed there. So you'll be able to take that, use it immediately to get started in terms of loading your map in and then take over to set the projection to your UTM zone, start building out the scales that you need, and then change the surrounding elements just as Steve kind of walked us through there. And the last thing I took away, Steve, that you said was really important, make sure the, the print to scale or it is always set. So you want to make sure that you're printing the maps at the appropriate scale, not stretching those that render the scale useless, all the work that you've put into that. So Steve, thanks for, for taking the time to walk through it. All right, so let's transition now. Let's take a look at the next part of this puzzle, which is moving into the web environment. And for that, we've got Pete Hanna who's going to join us today. So Pete, I'm going to pass the ball to you, and we're going to pick up basically starting with web map environment. How do we start adding USNG into the web world? And then we'll continue on to the web apps after that. So Pete, the stage is all yours. Okay, Ryan, thank you very, very much. I uh, hope everybody can see my screen. Um, so here we got uh, USNG on ArcGIS Online. <clears throat> so you can see that the entire United States is covered here. Um, but the first thing I want to do is show you that where you can go out and get this information. So you come up here to the Add feature, and you go here and search for layers. Okay. So in the ArcGIS Online environment, you just type in simply USNG, hit Go, and you can see there is a number of layers here for USNG. The layer that I'm using right now is from the federal user community, but this NGA layer above here is exactly the same layer. So I don't have to add that, but um, you can see that there's lots and lots of options here. The one caveat that I would say to, to make sure is that you get your data from a reputable source. You don't want to be using something that uh, is from Mr. Smith uh, that really doesn't know what he's doing and he's uh, published data that is erroneous. So we have the data here, and as you can see, if we open it up, um, we have all kinds of data in here, all the way down to 100-meter uh, grids, uh, which we'll get to later. But here we are uh, with the United States, and I'm just going to zoom into here uh, an area that I'm familiar with. I'm from Maryland, even though it doesn't sound like it. Um, but uh, you can see right off the bat, the state of Maryland, like many states, is divided into two different grid designations. So we have 18 and 17. And the state of Maryland is in 18S and 17S. And uh, one thing you'll notice right off the bat, and it becomes more apparent when you zoom in a little closer, is that the grids don't line up square like they do in uh, desktop, like Steve was showing you. So uh, you see 17S is coming in at an angle, and, and 7, 18S is coming in at a little different angle. Uh, the reason for that is the projection system. It is not in UTM, uh, and you, uh, unfortunately, uh, AGOL, you can't change the projection system. We have everything in Web Mercator. So, uh, he, Right off the bat, you're going to see a little, uh, a little weirdness with your lines. They're not exactly square. But the, the thing to take away is that these are the national grids, and um, <clears throat> they are exactly the, the measurements um, that they are required to be, which you'll see in a minute. So if I – another caveat with the ArcGIS Online data in this grid format is when you turn off the, the grid – next to it. So um, here for your 17S, this 17S QD 5784 should be a complete square. And when uh, you use desktop, uh, you, you can do that. Uh, when creating a map in desktop, uh, you would create one map for the 18S grids and one map for the 17S grids and project them based off of the UTM uh, grid designation that they're in to, to make sure that you're able to have the entire square and the entire grid uh, covered. So just to make sure that that's one downfall to using um, USNG on ArcGIS Online. But like I said, you can actually zoom in, and this is our 100-meter grids. Now, 
The next caveat to the 100 meter grids is that we don't have coverage for the entire United States. And I'll show that in just one second. But you can see here, if I bring out my measuring tool, um, and we're, we're on meters, if I click here and go exactly there is 100 meters. The grid is exactly as it uh, is supposed to be. And that is for every single one of the grids, uh, 1,000 meters, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you have coverage for the 100-meter grids in most of the metropolitan areas, and they extend fairly uh, far out. Um, but uh, if you're operating in an area, make sure that you have coverage before you start hosting it. Uh, I, I wouldn't want somebody to have an operation in a rural area and, and, and have coverage in part of it, but then not in the other areas, uh, especially with this layer. Um, I can show you um, where these grids uh, end up, and I think it's clear on the west side of the grid. Uh, you can see right there that uh, we start to lose coverage when we get around into rural areas here. Uh, and unfortunately, it, it, it turns off at, at zoom scales, so you can't really zoom out to the entire uh, boundary of your 100 meter grid to see exactly where it is. Um, but I've jumped around and, and shown that in the south, uh, there's, there's where it borders, and uh, in the east it borders um, in, in different locations. Uh, so you can absolutely see that um, we, we do lose coverage, but in most, uh, the east coast is, is very good uh, when you turn on um, all the layers, you'll see in the north, um, we continue, I believe you continue to have coverage because Philadelphia overlaps and comes down. So you want to make sure that, that your area has coverage. It may take two metropolitan areas to cover that area, but um, make sure you do have the coverage before you um, use this in the web application, web environment. Uh, another source you can reach out to is your local government. And so uh, Maryland, the state of Maryland has hosted USNG coordinates up online, and, um, and you can use that. Um, they go down to a thousand meter grids for their hosting. Um, they don't go down to uh, 100 meter grids, which would be local events that you would use 100 meter grids. But um, I can show you here that um, here you only see that 17 S is added to my data set, but you can also add, once you have um, the URL and the service, you can type the URL and find out the information from your, from your state representatives or either local jurisdiction representatives and add that data in and there we go, we've completed out the entire state of Maryland for United States National Grid. And again, you can zoom in, and uh, this data is very similar, if not the same data that was used uh, from, um, from FDC, FDGC, and you can see that unfortunately we don't have the grids completed out for each one of the, the grid designations, which I need to talk to our state representatives and see if we can't get that completed. So again, the takeaways from our usage of ArcGIS Online is uh, the coordinate system is Web Mercator, and your lines are going to come in at an angle. They're not going to be completely square like they would be at uh, using in desktop. Um, but they are absolutely as needed or as shown in the in the measurements, they are exactly what they need to be as far as as a distance. So these can be measured and used uh, for search and rescue um, on in the web environment. So that completes uh, my take on USNG and online, and I can kick this back to uh, Ryan to complete the next portion. All right. So, so thanks, Pete. So good couple of takeaways there uh, on Pete's side. So give you some good tips, right? Number one, check the source regardless of where uh, 
uh, you full, you pull data. So in the case of what Pete showed, FGDC and the, the federal user community. So always check the source, right? It's always a good practice for data. Um, ArcGIS Align is a great resource, but it also is kind of a dumping ground for everybody that does testing. And you've probably done that yourself. I know I have where you create layers for testing and, and they're not full production yet, right? So always check the source of the layer and then look for gaps, right? So go to your, your jurisdiction, zoom in down to the 100 meter, start looking for those gaps. And if need be, look at how you create your own data or work with a partner at a different level of government to maybe provide that for you if they've already done it. Um, if you're looking at how to build polygons in U.S. National Grid for your jurisdiction, the resource link at the end of today's virtual training will provide a document uh, that was originally done by the state of Florida. Uh, and that gives you some good guidance of how to start creating polygons for your area of interest uh, if there are gaps. You know, the web mercator distortion is there for all data sets. Um, you notice it most, especially at those zone intersections. And Pete talked about it, Steve talked about it on the desktop side. So knowing that the tools account for that inside of ArcGIS Online is key, right? Just gives you that, that comfort. So do some testing, use the measure, just get comfortable with the environment itself. And one thing I think, uh, Pete, on your side that I always recommend as well is, you know, enable the pop-ups. So make sure that those grids, if they're available for you, you configure the pop-ups and turn it on. So we want the web map to be able to provide good information to the user. So in that case, configure the pop-ups, make sure they're enabled so that when you touch the web map later in these applications we're gonna step into next, that the pop-up actually returns the result of what the grid label actually is. So the 100 meter grid label will pop up uh, onto that as well. All right, so thanks Pete, good job. So we're going to take a look now at taking the next step. You know, the web map uh, area that, that Pete talked about is, you know, where I'd say we, we get our GIS geek on, right? It's the GIS interface for us to build and configure data layers, configure the pop-ups as a GIS specialist. But really we want those maps then to work for the operations folks and their decision support that they need. And that's really where the application side comes into this. So we're going to take a look today at the web application builder. And for those that have never used web application builder, my simplest definition of that, it's a, it's a configurable web application that has a widget framework built into it, which allows you to extend GIS user functionality as needed. And that's key as we go forward and into this. So let me pull up the screen here. I'm going to start back in a group. So I'm looking at a group that we've all shared. This is Pete and, and Steve and I. So I'm going to pick up the same map that uh, Pete was working on a second ago on the FGDC side. And I'm going to go ahead and open that map up. So Pete's done all the good work already. He's configured the, the grids already on the side. Information's loaded in here. I've got the same bookmarks that Steve was, you know, navigating, I'm sorry, that Pete was navigating around into. Everything works the same. So once that part is done, the web map has been configured, the next step is doing the share and then create the web app. So to get to the web application builder or to any application that you want to configure, the first step is you're going to go to share. Make sure that you have shared the information and save the web map if it prompts you. And then the next thing you want to do is going to create a web app in the bottom right. So when we click create a web app, there are a number of things that show up in this palette. These are specific to different use cases, right? So if I'm doing editing, for example, find routing directions to points and, and features and so on. These are templates that allow me to take my web map and then expose it as an application that's kind of pre-configured and allows me just to then tweak it from there. The one we're going to talk about today is Web App Builder. So it's a separate tab. So at the top, you'll see Web App Builder. When I click that, it's going to ask me to give a name to it. So I'm going to call this my Web App Builder example for today's demo. Give it some tags. So make sure this is uh, easily findable later. Training, for example. Give it a summary. I'm going to cheat and make my summary pretty, pretty standard here and then get started. And what that's doing is now taking the web map that Pete just built for us, configured, and now puts it inside of my, my nice little configured web app builder. And this is that widget framework that I was talking about. You know, this is a configurable application, so with a minimal amount of work, it allows me to change the layout and the theme of this as I need to, change coloring maybe to match my organization. I can change my logos out and so forth. And the two things we're going to focus on is under the widget side. So at the top, as I mouse forward, the map has already been selected. We've got our web map chosen. Under the widget side, the one widget that really is important for us today is this coordinate widget right here. So the second one on the list. And you'll notice when I mouse over that, the bottom left of the window actually changes colors and kind of highlights what widget uh, and what kind of function we're seeing on top of the application. So by default, you notice as I mouse around here, if you kind of follow the the numbers at the bottom, we're in decimal degrees, right? So we're getting decimal de degree coordinates 
everywhere that my mouse is pointing. So what we're going to do is make sure that that actually reads U.S. National Grid. So to do that, you're going to start up here in the pop, click the little pencil which allows me to then edit the functionality behind it. You'll notice the default it's actually already pulling the web mercator. The output coordinate system is where we want to focus. So I'm going to click the edit function uh, underneath the actions. And then display units is where we're already set for decimal degrees using the drop down allows me to scroll to the bottom and actually select U.S. National Grid. So this is already set up inside of ArcGIS Online, inside of the Web App Builder. So a simple kind of hidden configuration there that's really key. So when I select U.S. National Grid and hit OK at this point, hit OK one more time, and now you notice when my mouse kind of moves, now I'm actually seeing the full USNG coordinates. So 16S, EB, and then the, the coordinates for that specific location. So that's the key point, right? So make sure we're just simply checking that pretty minimal in terms of configuration. A lot of folks overlook it. So that's one, one place to start. The other thing I want to show you on this piece uh, is kind of where we started the conversation today. So how do we use this uh, and a couple of tips around this. I'm going to zoom in kind of the Washington area, same place that Steve started us today. I'm going to zoom on in towards the U.S. Capitol here. So you'll notice now I've got my grids or drawing in here, which is great. As I mouse now, you're seeing the numbers are changing. So the more digits that we see in the, inside of that number, so in this case, the 25747, the more digit, the more accurate I get inside of this grid itself, right? So more digits gets me more accurate in terms of the location itself. The one thing I want to notice, though, when I mouse, this changes all the time. So if I were to want to collect, for example, this little reflecting pool right in front of the Capitol, I could mouse over and then write that down. But if you happen to bump the mouse or somebody comes along and you shake for a little bit, on the, for example, that's always going to change. So there's a neat little trick down here. The little bullseye here, if I click that, now you'll notice instead of changing as I mouse, what's going to happen is when I click the screen, it actually drops a point on the map, and now I've got a full USNG coordinate that I can copy. Right? So I can right-click, copy that, and I can use that coordinate, paste it into an email, paste it into an application as I need to. I can continue doing that, right? So collect multiple points if I wanted to get USNG coordinates for various locations. You'll notice it changes, and it will stay there until I click again. Now, a key point, that's not a feature in the map that we can do anything with, right? So think of it as much like an acetate layer for your map. So all it is is a, you know, a transient layer. I can't do routing against that. I can't use that point for anything else other than getting that specific coordinate at this point. So that's my two tricks for, for number one. The second thing I want to show you up here on the top in terms of functionality inside of Web App Builder is how do you actually find a location using USNG? So I've got a coordinate here that we're going to type just like we started today, US, so 18S UJ, I'm going to go to 257520-06465 and hit return. So I'm typing that in just like I would an address. So instead of 100 Main Street, I've actually got the coordinates I'm going to drop in and when I hit return, You'll notice that it's finding a USNG geocoder and says this is where you're located. So if I were to cut and paste this, drop it in here, it would do the same. If somebody calls in over the radio and has a coordinate, I can do the same here by typing it in. Or a user in the field on a tablet or device of connectivity could do the same thing by typing in a coordinate up here at the top and finding it. So it works just like an address geocoder, geocoding against the grid cells or the polygons that you see for the U.S. National Grid. So how do we make sure that that function is there? So you'll notice in my dropdown, I've got the Esri World Geocoder, which all organizations have by default, and I've got a USNG Geocoder. So let's talk about that for just a second. How do we enable that function uh, on the back end? I'm going to skip ahead here for a second. So right here where we're starting, for, for those of you who are administrators inside of your organization, that's where you come in and play a role. If you're not an administrator for your ArcGIS Online organization, you need to just reach out to your administrator and ask them to do these couple of steps here that we're going to talk through. So the first thing you're going to go to is to my organization as an administrator. And when you do that, you get a series of buttons at the top that are not available to all users. So I've got an ability to do edit settings against my organization. And when I edit settings, it's going to be a whole series of things. This is where I would change the front end look of my organization, for example, the image that's shown, the gallery that's there, the look and feel of my organization. But there's a lot of really powerful things behind here as well. And the one that we're focused on is this utility services. Um, there was a question that came through our chat a second ago that asked, is there a PRIT widget for 
the web environment. So no, by default, there's not a great print widget that would allow you to do all the great things that Steve showed earlier in, in desktop and print a nice USNG-ready map from the web. However, if you have your own environment, your infrastructure, and you wanted to serve a print service that is configured to your template with your logo and look and feel, you can actually register that here as a print service, for example. The one that we're really important to talk about as we get to USNG is this add a geocoder. So when I click add geocoder, you can use this sample service here for testing. This is the one that we're using and just used inside a web app builder uh, for the NAPSIC Foundation. And it'll give you a great place to start to test the functionality and do your kind of research and development on as well. This is a sample server, right, hosted by Esri. So don't count on it production-wise, but it's a great place to start. Make sure that things are working well in your org. So you would simply take that URL, just like Pete showed earlier when he had a URL for his service to the U.S. National Grid polygons. We have the service URL for this geocoder for the U.S. National Grid. Click Add Geocoder, paste that link directly in, and then you're adding that U.S. National Grid geocoder to your, your or ArcGIS Online organization. Excuse me. Now, there are a couple of important tips here, though, that I want to pass along when you do that, and these are really key. So the first thing that I want you to remember is when you add that U.S. National Grid locator, move it up to the top position. So if I go back a page here to show you, you'll notice I've got arrows here on the left-hand side. By default, the Esri World geocoder is probably what most people are going to have in the organization, unless you have a local geocoder. So if you have a local geocoding service for address points or street center lines, for example, you may have that registered here as well. But use the arrows and move the U.S. National Grid geocoder to the top position, just like you see here in the screenshot so that it's above the world geocoder. And that's important. The reason why is that it helps avoid errors when you type in a U.S. National Grid coordinate uh, and make sure that it's actually first geocoded against that geocoder as opposed to going to a street address geocoder in the world geocoder. And what that happens, if I were to type 18SUJ, for example, as we did, if it hits the world geocoder first, there's a chance that it could find something that it thinks is an address and a street name, and that could be anywhere in the world and throw you way off and the coordinates don't match whatsoever. Moving that USNG coordinator, uh, coordinate locator to the top first position ensures that it hits that first, it's going to find a match immediately and not filter down to the next one or trickle down to the next locator. So you're going to get a better return and result to make sure that you get the most accurate response for the geocoder. So number one, make sure it's at the top. Number two, the thing to take away is to make sure that you're using the geocoder name and the place text um, attributes when you add the geocoder to make sure that your users can find it if they need it. So by default, you notice in our web app builder when we looked back on the application front, it's automatically searched when I typed in an address here and hit return, it automatically finds USNG geocoder. Now if you had a series of geocoders, maybe there were three or four, and for some reason it wasn't moved to the top and people were finding errors when they geocoded against the U.S. National Grid, they may just want to be able to go down and use the drop down and select that USNG geocoder to make sure that the results are as accurate as possible. So to make that name visible, USNG geocoder, that's where you need to make sure that you're using the geocoder name properties when you add it. And the place text is a great opportunity to give them an example entry. So the geocoder name in our web map builder that we just showed is yeah, USNG geocoder. Place text might be for example, enter 18S UJ and give some digits just to help the user understand the context of how to enter a coordinate as accurate as possible. So a good couple of takeaways there in terms of the, the configuration for administrators. Again, this slide deck and the presentation will be available for download, so you can use that sample service. You can test this and, and make sure that you get your configuration set just right so that your web maps work and your applications work as well for geocoding against USNG. All right, so let's take a couple minutes and kind of wrap up the presentation side. You've heard a lot of information today on the desktop and web and, and application world, and there are a ton of other resources to get you started. So some of you may be brand new to building U.S. National Grids and you want more information on how do I do that, how do I get started with U.S. National Grid, and that's what this resource page that we've put together from the NAPSIC Foundation is meant to provide. So this short URL you see at the top right corner will land you on a page under our resource center that's specific to U.S. National Grid. It starts at the very beginning of why should you even use U.S. National Grid, so if you need background resources for implying that, um, there are a couple of links here to, to do that. If you're wondering how to get started, so basic implementation and guidance, you'll find that in the next section. So how do you implement U.S. National Grid in your organization 
there's a video introduction to U.S. National Grid specifically for those of us in public safety. There's some tips on how to read U.S. National Grid. So Steve talked about the Romer scale and how do you use that. So there's actually a, a little bit of tips if you've never used that before or need some training around how to interpret U.S. National Grid and read it specifically from the paper maps. That third link will take you there. And then there's a USNG uh, Romer scale, this grid card reader template is a great place. So if you're looking for what scales are applicable, when I go back to that reference scale that Steve talked about, that's a good place to reference back. It gives you that same image that Steve looked at there to give you a place to get started. Then there are some tools. So for those of you that are ready to start building your paper map products, I mentioned at the beginning there is a map template. This is a map package that's available for download in ArcGIS 10.0 through 10.3.1. It's a 1 to 24 scale U.S. national grid map that follows all the surrounding elements that Steve laid out. Already has some labeling done for you that you can copy and edit the text in. The surrounding elements at the bottom, like the grid zone designator and the magnetic arrow and so forth, are all text elements. So you can do it manually um, as you need to and get comfortable and practice that process. A uh, great place to start. And then if you find those gaps, like Pete mentioned, in the web environment, so if you zoom to an area and you don't have polygons available for U.S. National Grid, the second one is the guideline for how do you build and start to, to populate your U.S. National Grid polygons over your jurisdiction. The community itself has a ton of other resources. We've tried to just catalog a few of those. The USNG Center, the FGD source, FGDC resource site as well. Uh, a number of resources there that may take a look at, get examples, and reach out uh, if you have questions on that. Today's training was very technical, right? So we wanted it to be focused for GIS specialists, folks working inside of, of public safety organizations. However, if you need help communicating U.S. National Grid and, and understanding how operations um, employs U.S. National Grid, there are two other virtual trainings that we've done uh, with the NAPSIC Foundation. The short URLs you see at the top will link you directly to those. Uh, you can also find them on the NAPSIC Foundation website, which is just napsicfoundation.org. Both of those have video recordings as well as slides that you can download. One is about, again, applying that U.S. National Grid for decision support with an example is really around search and rescue operations. And the other one's kind of common daily operations and, and using USNG as a common location reference system for that. So take a look at those two videos as well, both an hour in length. Uh, we'll give you a great place to get started. If you do find that you've hit a dead end, so you've gone through the training, you've hit the resource page and you have questions, feel free to reach out. So you can contact us at the email you see at the top, so services at napsicfoundation.org. So we're here to help you, right, with our team like Pete and Steve, the geospatial subject matter experts in public safety are here to answer your questions anytime. Uh, we want you to have all the resources you need to be empowered through these trainings and on the online resource, but we also understand sometimes you just need to dig in a little bit deeper. Uh, you need somebody to sit with you and figure it out. That's what we're here for, whether that's uh, doing technical work, it's maybe business planning of how we implement USNG inside of an organization, thinking about the processes that go with that, or further training and education for additional staff or operations folks. We can help with that as well. So feel free to shoot an email if you do have questions beyond what you find available online. So I'm going to leave you with a couple of things before we take questions on this. Upcoming events. So we do have a series of upcoming virtual trainings just to point out. They'll continue through the end of the, the calendar year on this. Our next one in July is focused on accessing and using national data uh, for your preparedness efforts. So specifically look at the new Highfeld Open and we'll talk a little bit Highfeld Secure as well. In August, we'll talk about IPAWS, the Integrated Public Alerts and Warning System, and how we use that. Uh, September is an interesting one for me. I think we're, we're really interested in how we help agencies kind of assess where they are in terms of using geospatial uh, inside of their organizations to support the missions that you do every day. We're going to talk about how we have some tools to help with that in September. And then we'll cover mutual aid in October, and then we'll talk about increasing resilience and particularly kind of looking at climate change and adaptation around that in November. And then the one I'm most excited about coming up in September for the NAPSIC Foundation in partnership with the Department of Homeland Security is our second National Geospatial Preparedness Summit in Washington, D.C. So September 13th and 14th, it's free for local government, state government, regional government, federal government. So if you're a government employee, it's free for you to attend. It's a great mix of state and local and federal. Um, so don't feel like it's solely federal being in Washington, D.C. This is really meant for you as a community to come together. It's two days. You'll find keynote speakers. We're going to do workshops. It'll be hands-on training and kind of even exercise-related uh, environment where we're able to, to actually talk through and put some of these uh, issues into practice. The link on the screen will 
take you to the registration site. So do register spaces limited. And if you have questions, again, do feel free to reach out. We're happy to, to help as we can. So with that, I'm going to pause for a minute and pull up the question list, and we'll take a look at this, and we'll pass it around and see what we've got. So let me just kind of take a top uh, look down here. So number one, there was a question of will this presentation be available? So yes, on the resource page uh, that we described there, you'll be able to actually download this presentation PowerPoint uh, and actually watch the recording from today as well. Uh, we covered the question, there was one about a print widget available for ArcGIS Online. So no, there's not a default print widget that would allow you to do a nice surrounding element for that. There are some tools to help with that. If you have questions, let us know. We're happy to, to kind of point you in the right direction for that, that process as well. But you do have the ability to add a print uh, service into your Arc Design organization that would enable some of that, uh, a little more robust printing than you would get typically just out of the box. All right, so Kevin had a good question. This is, you know, my country that he works in is approximately 5,000 square kilometers. And his question is, would a 100,000 meter grid make sense for us to start? Um, Steve, this may be a good one for you. So you've worked in local government and you've covered kind of the, the thousand meters all the way up to uh, <laughs> the larger scale. What about guidance for Kevin? So with a 5,000 square kilometers country, where would you start and maybe the differences between scales for local and, and regional approach? Yeah, absolutely. You, you're talking about a scale that is just way too large, uh, whether it be for navigation or, or for running an incident. Uh, you definitely want to use your, your smaller grid still, uh, whether it be a 1,000 meter um, or 100 meter, or you can even go down to a 10 meter depending on the area that you're dealing with. Uh, even, you know, here in the U.S., you know, when you're dealing with a, a very broad area, uh, such as a wildfire or a wilderness search and rescue, uh, even though you're dealing with such a large area, you're still not going to use a um, – you know, 100,000 in the grid, you're still going to want to break that down into smaller grids. Um, the other thing that we really didn't discuss here uh, during this uh, webinar was the uh, your various uses of what you can use the U.S. National Grid for. I mean, typically it's used for, you know, marking the coordinates of an incident, uh, using it for navigation for your teams. Uh, but I had also had... Uh, written a paper and presented it to the FDMY uh, about actually using it to manage it. We can, what I had included was essentially two different scenarios. The first scenario being Hurricane Sandy, which uh, the incident covered, at least initially, uh, the, whole, the whole entire city. We, we had to be prepared for the whole entire city to be affected by the, by the storm. Uh, once the storm came and went, it was a little more of a focused area, specifically on the on the south shores of the city. Uh, but still, it was still a wide area. And and one of the concepts that I had thought about was uh, an incident commander can maybe use the thousand. Uh, sorry, the yeah, I'm sorry, the thousand meter grid to manage his teams. You know, have you know this grid is being or these grids are being managed by, you know, this ops section chief. I am sorry, ops branch chief. Uh, then maybe the ops branch chief is using the 100-meter grids to manage his various teams that are operating within there. And then maybe, you know, those supervisors are using the 10-meter grid to manage a much smaller uh, team that's maybe doing the, the search and rescue. Um, and, and you could scale it all the way from the 1,000-meter grid down to the 10 meter grid. Uh, then if you have another incident, such as say sept the September 11 terrorist attacks, um, now granted the, the magnitude of the incident was huge, but geographically it was very small. It, it was pretty much confined to the, the lower section of Manhattan. Um, and then actually as the days went on down there, the the frozen zone actually got smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, so maybe in that case, because it was a small geographic area, the incident commander maybe uses the 100-meter grid because it, your 1,000-meter grid would just cover the whole entire area. So how is he going to manage his resources? So maybe he uses the 100-meter grids uh, to manage who's where uh, and operating in, in what grids and maybe your ops. Uh, branch chief is using the 10 meter grid to manage his team and so on and so forth. So that's kind of one of the nice things with the U.S. National Grid is that it is very scalable and can be used for managing an incident. 
So I would definitely say, oh. you know, the hundred meter, or, I'm sorry, the hundred thousand meter grid, uh, you wouldn't have any benefit to using uh, in in your area. Yeah, thanks, Steve. And again, if you need, you know, help and guidance on where to start building a grid, uh, as Steve described, you know, the various scales of that. So reference the website you saw on there. It will give you a good place to get started on building the polygons and, and reach out if you have questions for that. All right, so we have another question about um, guidance to build grids at convergence zones. So basically where we've got UTM zones intersecting, we saw that in the web map environment. Uh, any kind of best practices for building grids for each one of those? And, you know, my take for that, and Steve, you guys answer as well, you know, best practice, make sure, again, that you're building grids for that UTM zone. So if you're in 17, building one for 17, and then build another grid for 18, and then make sure you're doing that so that those things uh, are accurate as appropriate, right? You're not getting that kind of web map <laughs> inflection that you would see. Any guidance on that, Steve, or, or Pete, from your side in terms of managing a, a geography where you have two different UTM zones? Yeah, it's similar to what Pete was showing, utilizing the web map. That's what you're going to see on a paper map. Um, so in, in my example, the Washington, D.C. area, and I'm dealing with, uh, with the 18S, 100,000 meter, um, I'm sorry, the 18S uh, grid zone uh, designation. If I try to add in uh, the, the grid zone designation to the east or the west, um, you're going to see similar to that web map where the grid lines are going to be on an angle. Um, now, for that one small area, especially when there's crossover, you can use that. Uh, you, you know, you can use those lines to measure and mark out your coordinate, but essentially what you you're, what you're going to want to do is pan over your map uh, to that next grid zone designation that that needs to be utilized and change your projection uh, to match that grid zone to the proper UTM zone. Uh, so then your your next grid zone designation, uh, you know, just like my map, the lines will be you know perfectly straight up and down with a true north. Uh, so on the edges. When you do have those crooked lines, yes, they can be used, uh, but then as, as a follow-up, you want to be creating a map for your next grid zone designation. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Steve. All right. And there was the last question I see today is, you know, the USNG geocoder that we showed as a sample, you know, does it use credits at the same rate as, you know, typical geocoding from, from Esri is promoted? So the, the answer to that is no. In this case, you know, it's it's not the same credit usage uh, as the world geocoder against that. Uh, it's none required of that. And again, just to kind of reiterate, that's a sample service USNG geocoder that's available to you. So, you know, just keep that in mind as you use it if you're kind of implementing it. Great for testing and on that, that point. If you have questions beyond that, reach out. We're happy to, to answer that for us. All right, so that's all the questions. So I just want to take a moment and say thanks to, to Steve and Pete, both for taking time out to present today. I appreciate it, guys, and good job on your presentation side of it. Thanks to all of you for attending today and taking time out to, to visit with us at the NAPSIC Foundation for this virtual training. And we look forward to seeing you on the next virtual training. If you have questions, email contact is listed on the slide right now. And then the short link to the USNG resource page on the NAPSIC Foundation is found there as well. With that, thanks for joining us and have a great rest of the day. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Pete. Thanks, Steve.